Welcome to the last summer in the city. It's a bummer, isn't it? But I'm so happy to be here with you guys. It's gonna be a great night. We've got baptisms, Grant is preaching. I'm so excited, I'm so expectant for what God, yeah, for what God wants to do tonight. And right now in my walk with God, I've just been so floored by salvation. The fact that I was lost and dead in my sin and Jesus came and he saved me by dying for me, dying the death that I should have died. And when he rose again, he canceled the curse of sin forever, once and for all. And so in an instant, we went from children of wrath to children of God, heirs to the kingdom, co-heirs with Christ. And I've heard people in the faith refer to this as blessed assurance. And what that means is that no matter what happens in this life, both good and bad, we have this confident hope that we belong to Jesus and nothing and no one could ever separate us from him. But also we know that when it's all said and done and this, this life has passed away, that we will be with him face to face and dwell with him forever. So there's this hymn that I love so much. It says, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. And if you don't know it, the words will be on the screen, but as we sing, let these words sink in because this is your testimony as people of God. And let that inform your worship tonight. So sing. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, have been purchased of God, born of his spirit, and we've been washed in his blood. This is my story. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is Praising my Savior all the day long. Praising my Savior. Praising my Savior all the day long. Praising my Savior all the day long. Does anyone come out to praise the Lord? Come on, he's good. He's faithful. Christ is my firm foundation. Sing it out. He's the rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaking up.
confident hope. And you know, as I've just been pondering the word hope, I, I can't help but feel like that there are people in this room who, who are looking for that confidence, who are looking for a hope to have confidence in. You know, I don't know what y'all might have walked into this place with, what you might be carrying with you right now in your life. the things that you might have given up on, the things that you might have lost hope in. But I was reminded of what it says in Ephesians 3, that it says that God is able to do more, abundantly more, than we can think or imagine according to his power that is working in us. And so I want us to cling on to that today. That you might have lost hope that that, that you might have dreams that you feel like that might have died. You might have things in your life that you feel like you've given up on. Maybe it's yourself. Maybe you've given up on yourself in this place tonight. But I want to remind you that Jesus is able to do abundantly more than you can ask, think, or imagine according to his power working within you. And I don't want us to forget that. I want us to be able to take a second to just look back, just like we said a second ago, and what Jesus has done for us, because that's what worship is. It's a response because we're reminded that Jesus is good, that he is faithful, that he gave his life so that we could have a relationship with him. That's the confident hope that we can hold on to tonight, that we can worship tonight, that we can celebrate tonight. We sing about that together. Jesus, we thank you that you're able to do more than we ask, think, or imagine. So would you do that tonight? In our hearts, and our lives, would you just meet with us? Would you revive the dreams? Well, when did I start to forget all of the great things you did? And when did I throw away faith for the impossible? Would you let your faith rise tonight? And how did I start to believe that you weren't sufficient for me? Why do I talk myself out of seeing miracles? Yes, our God does miracles, so sing this out. You are more than able. That's right. More than we ask, think, or imagine. You are more than able. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. You are. Yes, you are more than able. You just gotta believe. Oh, I've seen it before, and I'll see it again. That you are more than able. So who am I to deny?
follows me it's much more than I deserve because I know who I am who you say I am who you call and I can't stay where I'm at oh there's so much more and we've come this far by faith and I just can't turn back I'm not turning back Cause he's not done with me Oh, do you believe that today He's not done with me yet? Yes, I'm confident Cause there's so much more to the story Do you believe it That you're not done with me Oh, sing it out with confidence You're not done with me yet. Thank you, Jesus That you're not done with me Oh, let your hope rise Let your faith rise Sing. 
Yeah. 
come on. He's our God. He's an awesome God. He reigns from heaven. He stands alone. Oh, he's seated in throne. Our God is an awesome God. Sing, our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. Hey, we're over here in the baptismal pool, if you're, yeah, over here. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Summer in the City, night four. Come on. Man, that was amazing. Um, my name is Michael, if we haven't met, and uh, Chid kind of teased it earlier, but tonight we are celebrating baptisms together. And uh, if you've been here before, you know that there's nothing that we love more than celebrating the testimonies of people and hearing how God has come through for them and seeing his faithfulness in their lives. So uh, if you know someone that gets baptized, please stand with them, celebrate them. Uh, if you don't, you can go ahead and have a seat as we tell the stories. But I want to say every time someone gets dunked in one of these pools, we need to go crazy because there's nothing more worth celebrating than these stories of faithfulness. Uh, this is my boy Enoch right here. Crowd favorite, obviously. Uh, Enoch was born in the church and not in the way that like a lot of people were like, oh, I was raised in the church. Like he was born in the sanctuary of a church, which is true. Uh, in Nigeria, his, his dad was a pastor. Uh, and he grew up in an amazing family around the things of God and in the church. Uh, and so he grew up that way in Nigeria. And around age 13 was the first time that he felt God inviting him to sacrifice his life for him, to, to lay it down and live in his direction. And he put his faith in Jesus at the age of 13 years old. He went from death to life in Jesus. And that's amazing. Uh, it's a lot of people's stories in here, but just like a lot of us, as he went on uh, and got a little older, he, he started to lose a bit of that fire. Uh, when he was 16, him and his family moved to America, uh, New Jersey, if anyone's from the Northeast. And uh, okay, a couple shout outs. Uh, and he started going to church there with his family, but again, it was just kind of what he did his whole life, uh, just attending church, going. Uh, as he went through high school and started attending college, he was still kind of in that same place, and him and his family moved down here to Atlanta when he was about 19. Uh, and around then, he started going to church with his parents down here in Atlanta, but he started to feel like there was a void. He said he, he started feeling like he was hungry and not being fed, uh, and that was the first time that he started maybe returning to the Lord. But that was a process even in that. And a couple, another year passed and he started looking for another church and he, he started watching messages from Pastor Louis online. And he found himself in this room at a Sunday gathering in December of 2019. Uh, and we were talking about Passion Conference and going and he just made the decision that him and his sister were gonna go. So he bought two tickets and he went to, uh, to conference and pa Passion 2022 is the one that he attended at Mercedes Benz. And when he was there, he felt the presence of God in his heart like he had never before. And I would say at that point, you understood what, he understood what it felt like and what he needed to do was to give his entire life to Jesus and start living for him. But he was new to a church and he didn't know anybody. So he signed up for a YA family group that spring. Uh, and he showed up to this family group that was led by myself and another guy named Isaac. And the night that he showed up, there was only one other guy that came who was also new to the group. He didn't know anyone. Uh, and that guy, his name is Grant. He's sitting over here and they are best friends now. And he found this community. He started walking beside these people in a beautiful way. And now he's led in students for a year. Uh, he's actually this fall gonna lead a YA group himself with another guy from that same family group. And I've just, it's been such an honor to walk with you and to see God grab your heart and turn completely towards him. And I'm so proud of you, man. Whew, not gonna cry. So Enoch, because Christ died and rose and you put your trust in him, it is my joy to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Come on. This is my friend Grace. Um, she has been a part of our Passion family since April. 
Um, she, as we sat down and started talking testimony and God moves and just got to know each other more, um, she told me that she grew up in a Christian household, um, and because of her sweet grandfather, uh, he encouraged them to to church every Sunday, um, and they, like, went, and it was awesome, um, but she told me that she never really knew the difference between religion and relationship every time that, um, the pastor would, like, talk about that, um, and that she knew Jesus as a Bible story and words on a, on a holy page, but never knew him, um, a relationship with him, um, but in 2011, um, he unfortunately and very sadly passed away, um, and that's kind of when her family kind of shifted from going to church every Sunday to going on the major holidays and just every now and then, um, and then when she went to college, she found this deep place, um, that she knew needed filling, but didn't know what would fulfill it all the way. Um, so she turned to things that she knew that um, would fulfill it temporarily and then just turned to them over and over again, um, just as most of our stories are today. Um, but she um, just decided one day, she was like, this is it, I'm tired of it. I, I, she told me she was like, something just clicked and she just knew. Um, and so she came to Passion City, Cumberland, uh, the 1145 service, and um, came by herself and was sat on the front row um, next to me. And she just felt the whole service. She just experienced Jesus in a whole new way and heard him whispering to her and heard um, him calling out to her and just being like, Grace, come on, just give it all, just give it all. So she stood up during the response moment. Um, and that is where she went from death to life. And it was just an incredible day. And little did I know that I got to meet her on the day that she met Jesus. Um, and now we've connected and found out we're in the same apartment community together. And she's so on fire and so ready to just live in that life and that new creation that Jesus has given her. Um, and she's reached out. We're doing a Bible study together. Um, but now, Grace, I am so joyful to, because Jesus came and died and rose for you. I am so proud to baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Sakai and she goes to Georgia State. Wow, that was weak. Come on. All right, all right. She grew up in Mableton with her family and with her parents, and they had their own experiences with church and with God. But Sakai told me that by the time she was growing up, the conversations were kind of sparse. She would go to church with her mom or with her aunt, but she was still left with a lot of questions. It wasn't until she went to Georgia State where she really wanted to dig into faith for herself. And in doing that, she came across a message online from Pastor Mike Todd at Transformation Church. And it talked about how a lot of times we think that if we're just good enough people and we do enough good things that we can like earn our way to heaven. And this really resonated with Sakai because this is really how she saw herself and how she saw God. But with this new revelation, she began to dig deep and read the Bible for herself. And she discovered that there's really no amount of good deeds that you can do to earn your way to God, but that he's waiting with open arms to rescue you, to save you, and to call you into the life that he has for you. So she's wrestling with this new reality, right? And she's thinking, well, maybe I should get plugged into a church. She sees someone post on Instagram about passion, and she grabs her sister and decides to come to a Sunday gathering. So Kai told me she was really nervous because she had never been to church without her mom or her aunt before, but this was actually her choice. And when she pulled up, she saw a familiar face from high school, our very own YA, Brendan. He actually parked her car for her, which I think is amazing. Shout out to Brendan. We love him in here. But it was just such a beautiful picture of how mindful God was of Sakai, even in that moment. So Sakai kept coming to church. She kept kind of wrestling with the Bible for herself. But she told me that she was still living one foot in, one foot out. And then about two months ago, she told me that she broke down. And she was really confronted with the fear of the Lord. She could really sense that he was calling her into a better life. And she told me he was giving me a choice and I wanted to choose him. And it was that night when she went from death to life in Christ. <laughs> Fast forward a few weeks, she came to somewhere in the city where Pastor Louis did a talk on the wedge and about how a lot of times we like to compartmentalize Jesus into a part of our life, but he really wants our whole life. 
Pastor Louie did a call at the end of that message, and Zakai didn't go up because she was nervous, but leaving that night, she knew her next step wasn't just to accept Jesus for herself in her room, but it was to publicly declare that she was living this life with Jesus. Yeah. So she applied to be baptized. She's here today. And to kind of tell me on the other side of this, she's experienced so much peace that she's not in competition with where anyone else is, that God's in complete control of her life, and that she has this newfound passion to share her story with her friends and her family. And then she said this, if she could share anything with her generation, it would be that if you're counting your deeds and your actions, you're missing the point, that it's not about what you're doing, but it's all about what God did for you. So because Christ died and rose for you and you've put your trust in him, it's my joy to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is my friend, Zach. Zach is from South Carolina and grew up in a Christian family, and he went to church often, but didn't have a personal relationship with Jesus. He had a number of difficulties growing up, including abuse, addiction, and a lack of purpose that left him feeling shame and emptiness. In college, that hole dug deeper as he tried to fill it with drinking alcohol and marijuana use. He even explored other religions besides Christianity. At his lowest point in the spring of 2021, Zach was given marijuana that was laced with fentanyl and he overdosed to the point that he had to be revived by paramedics. But God, God saved Zach's life that night. And looking back, God was never far from Zach. He was there in his upbringing through Christian friends that loved on him along the way. And that night that he overdosed, he even remembers telling the paramedics that he just needed Jesus. He had an interaction with God after that. He was renting a room from a priest in Charleston, South Carolina. And in that bedroom, there was a bookshelf of Bibles. One night, Zach decided to read the Bible and pray. He said that he broke down, called out to God, and just felt an unexplainable peace. After that, he knew he needed a Bible. So he went online, and no joke, he didn't know anything about Passion City Church, but he ended up buying a Passion Resources Jesus Bible. And in December of 2021, he decided he wanted a new life and moved to Atlanta, Georgia. He had heard a sermon from Pastor Louie online, so he decided to come to Passion City Church and started attending regularly. That year, he was praying for community, and he found himself in this room at the last summer in the city gathering. And after baptisms, Pastor Grant asked if anyone wanted to stand and put their faith in Jesus. It was that night that Zach surrendered it all and went from death to life. You guys, that same night, God answered a prayer. He introduced Zach to Nick, and Nick invited him to a Monday night Bible study where he would meet his best friends and see his faith explode. Zach, it's been a privilege, and it's a privilege to be standing here with you. And I'm just so proud of the way you plan yourself in this church through young adults, uh, Bible study, and serving on the experience team. So because Christ died and rose for you, and you put your faith in him, it's my joy to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Wow. Incredible. Can we uh, just thank God that the gospel is alive and taking new ground? And um, to Enoch, Grace, to Kai, Zach, thank you for sharing your story with us. This is a work of God. Nobody can save anybody but God. You don't get saved because you come to church and you like the church. You don't get saved because somebody preached a message that you like. You don't get saved because somebody sang the song you like. You get saved because God showed up and God said, I'm available right now to you. And if you want to come with me, you can through the door of my son. And um, I just sensed sitting there that there's somebody in this room right now. You don't need another talk. You've been one foot in, one foot out. 
They, they just gave you the talk. Jesus is available just like he was to Zach. He's available to you now. It's up to you to decide. Choose this day who you're going to serve. You come to church maybe a hundred times. You know every song. But that's not going to be good enough at the end of the day that you knew all the songs. The question is going to be, did you receive the gift of life through the doorway of my son's death? And if you have not said yes to that question, then tonight I did not come to just come to church. I did not come because I have some thoughts together or I read some verses that I want to share with you. I came to meet with God. That's what church is. It's not an event, not a thing you show up to. It's not programmatic, so we're gonna sing songs, somebody's gonna talk, then some people are gonna put their faith in Jesus. No, it's very likely that people wanna put their faith in Jesus in the worship. And people wanna put their faith in Jesus through baptisms. And I just, it may be one person in this room, but, but before we get into the message, just, just for some confidence that this is God, this is the Holy Spirit working in the hearts of people. I just wanna give somebody a chance who's one foot in and one foot out. Y your story was that story. And if God can do for them what he did for them, then he can do for you what you need him to do for you. And I just wanna pray, I'm not gonna be hypey. I just wanna pray because heaven is open now. It will be hopefully, Lord willing, 30 minutes from now, but it's open right now and we have right now. And I just wanna pray. And so I would love to invite you to just close your eyes. And I don't know who the one person I'm sitting over there in worship, God, somebody's ready right now to put their faith in Jesus. They don't need you to talk. They don't need Chinema to sing anymore. They just need me and I'm here and I just spoke to them and they're ready right now. And so just with every head bowed, all eyes closed, I wonder who that person is that just right now you need to say, Jesus, I'm in. I've been one foot in, one foot out. I've been distant from you. I've been trying to earn my way up to you and it hasn't worked. I've ran to a million different things that let me down and I'm tired of doing that. And so tonight, if there is a chance for me to have the thirst of my soul quenched in you and you're available, why would I wait another second? And if heaven is open now, I wanna step through the door. And if that's you, every, this is just a moment between you and God. This is not about me, this is about you, this is about God, this is about eternity. I just wanna give you a chance to say, that's me right now. And if I can say yes now, I wanna say yes now. I never said yes, and if I can say yes now, because of what Jesus has done for me, I wanna say yes now. If that's you and you're here, could I just pray for you, lead you to put your faith in Jesus? This is your time right now. And I'd love to just know who that, maybe it's just one person. Honestly, it may just be one person, but you're ready right now to put your faith in Jesus. Would you just lift your hand up wherever you are so I can see you? Just like Zach's story, you wanna put your faith in Jesus. Awesome, thank you so much, praise God. Awesome, thank you so much, I see you. I see you here in the back, praise God. I see you right here, praise God. Over here on my right hand side, I see you all the way in the back of this section. Thank you. Amazing. All the way in the top, I can see your hand all the way up there. Praise God. Thank you. All the way over here in the left, in the top. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. This is your work, Jesus. Thank you. Anybody else? Right here, I see you. Two hands. Beautiful. Thank you so much. I see you right over here. I just want to pray with you. I see you right over here. Thank you. I see you right here, man. Thank you so much. It's awesome. I see you right here. Beautiful. I want this to be uh, from your heart. You have to put your faith in Jesus. I can't put your faith in Jesus, but I wanna help lead you. And we just say to him today, in your own words, from your own heart, Jesus, thank you for moving towards me tonight. Thank you for speaking for me, to me tonight. Thank you for grabbing hold of my heart tonight. My eyes have opened to see you and to receive you. And I, I, I wanna say right now, I wanna put my faith, I wanna put my hope, I wanna put my trust, I wanna put my confidence, I wanna put my future in your hands. I wanna turn from all the lesser things and I wanna put my life in your hands. And the scripture says, if you believe in your heart and if you confess with your mouth that Jesus, not just is a good person, 
Not just as a good teacher, but that he's Lord. That means what he says goes. If you just want to say that in your own life, Jesus, I want to declare right now that over my life, you are Lord. Then the scripture says, for all those who did receive him, Jesus, he's given you the right to become sons and daughters of God. And maybe you can just say thank you. Thank you that for the 23 years of my life, all my steps have been ordered up to this moment so I can meet with God and my eternity could be changed. Jesus, thank you for meeting people in this space. Thank you for doing the work. Holy Spirit, thank you for working in the hearts of people. I pray that you'll seal up in each one of these people's lives. I pray that you'll rally community around them. I pray that they would know that this isn't the end. This is a start. This is a beautiful, way bigger life ahead of them than they can ever imagine. And we just give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Beautiful. Amen. Wow. Uh, if we ha uh, haven't met, I'm Grant, and uh, I'm so excited to be here. I'm so excited to um, add my voice into the mix. This summer has been uh, incredible, and uh, the, the, the thread of the messages talking about idolatry, if you haven't listened to all the messages there uh, on YouTube, I want to encourage you to go listen to them. Um, Camilo's message, I told him this yesterday, one of the best messages I've heard. Uh, so if you haven't heard that, setting up kind of the whole thing, you really kind of got to go through that door to get into, the, I think, what God's really been doing through the whole summer. Um, and then Pastor Louis' talk, uh, so helpful just around the idol of pleasure. And then if you were here uh, for the last night of Summer in the City with Miles, um, talking about the idol of image. And I'm excited uh, to talk tonight ab about a different idol, one that I think most of us, if not all of us, uh, struggle with. But I want to catch you up because maybe you haven't been able to make all the nights, and maybe you missed uh, one or two, and Camilo gave a definition for what an idol is on the first night <coughs> that I think is incredibly helpful. So um, this is the definition. An idol is anything, person, or idea in which you put your ultimate functional trust that is not God. One more time. Anything, person, or idea in which you put your ultimate functional trust in that is not God. I love that. That's brilliant. Here's the thing about idols, okay? They're tricky. The reason why they're tricky is because they're not inherently bad things. So pleasure is not bad. That's not the message. Resist pleasure. Run from pleasure. God created us to enjoy pleasure. Image is not bad. I, I could go to a hundred places in the scripture where we're told to take care of our bodies. We're given stewardship over our bodies. So it's not bad to take care of our bodies. That's a good thing. That's a godly thing. That's a biblical thing. So what's the problem? The message is not stay away from these things. The message is a warning that humanity has a long history of taking good things and making them ultimate things, and that's dangerous. Idolatry at its root is when we take something God created that is good and we make it ultimate. That becomes dangerous. That becomes idolatrous. Ian Bounds said it this way. One of the wiliest tricks of the enemy is to destroy the best by the good. Here's Tim Keller's definition in, in the book that was so helpful to me leading into tonight is a book by Tim Keller named Counterfeit Gods. If you haven't read it, I wanna recommend it with all I have, I buy it. I don't know how much it is on Amazon, but it'll be worth your money. Here, here's what he says. He calls idols counterfeit gods with a little g. I like that. He says, it's anything more important to you than God. Anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God. Anything you seek to give you what only God can give you. A counterfeit God is anything, listen to this, so central and essential to your life that should you lose it, your life would feel hardly worth living. I don't know the details in the background of every person in this room's story. But I know that we all have idols. 
And I know that our idols are stealing more from us than they are giving to us. It was John Calvin that said that the human heart is an idol factory. And so I came tonight to caution you, to, to warn you, and to plead with you, don't live a small life. You're going to get one shot. James calls it a vapor. It's here today. It's gone tomorrow. And you get a shot to, to live your life for something, to have an impact on planet Earth, to, to live 50, 60, 80 years. Who knows what tomorrow holds? But your life is meaningful, and how you leverage and steward your life is meaningful. And I want to just plead with you, don't settle for worshiping created things when the creator of all things is available to you. That's what idol worship was. Imagine how silly that is, that we would worship things that we made with our own hands. Now, the term worship in our English language is the combination of two words, worth and ship. So in a very real sense, a literal sense from the word, we worship what we think is worth it. That whatever you ascribe worth to, you will give your worship to. And so throughout the Old Testament and throughout the New Testament and throughout all of human history, humanity has this propensity to worship worthless things. And when we read about the way that they would do it in Exodus, we read and go, what kind of idiots were these people? And yet when we take inventory of our own lives, I would imagine speaking for myself and probably speaking for you, we, we have that same tendency because we're part of fallen creation and we have a sin nature that we ascribe worth to things that have none. And Jesus, the Lord, speaking about idols, often says, often uses the word, they are worthless. So why would we worship that which is worthless? Isaiah 2.8 says, their land is full of idols. They bow down to the work of their own hands, to what their fingers have made. And since page three of our Bibles, humanity has had this propensity to worship that which was worthless. Tim Keller says, if you love anything in this world more than you love God, you will crush that object under the weight of your own expectations. And I found that to be true in my own life. So when you look at the threat of idols, I think what I'm hoping to do tonight is get to this root that's underneath a lot of the idols in our lives. <clears throat> Leviticus 19.4 says, Do not turn to idols or make metal goods for yourselves. Leviticus 26.1, Do not make idols or set up an image or a sacred stone for yourself. Habakkuk 2.18, of what value is an idol carved by a craftsman or an image that teaches lies? And listen to this, for the one who makes it trusts in his own creation. He makes idols that cannot speak. So you see this thread. They made, the, he says, don't turn to idols or make metal goods for who? For yourself. Do not make idols or set up an image or sacred stone for yourself. Habakkuk 2, for the one who makes it, that person makes it and trusts in it himself, in his own creation. So what's at the bottom? What's at the root? That's, that's what I'm hoping to get to tonight. Because uh, if we just trim the surface stuff, and, and, and I don't know who came up with this, but when you talk about idols, there's surface idols and source idols. And a lot of people have taken that and run with it. It was not me who came up with that. Whoever did was brilliant. But we're, we can kind of see the surface idols. But what I want to get to tonight is what's, what's the source idol? What's underneath? As I got older in life, something happens to a man where he begins to pride himself on what his yard looks like. I don't know when it happened. Uh, I, I really don't. But all of a sudden, it happened. I have a yard that's about as big as this stage right here, but I have a ride in lawnmower, and I like being on it. 
It's called a big dog. It's got LED lights on the front. It can't turn off. So you see me in the middle of the day on the Marietta Square cutting my grass. I got my LED lights on and I'm on my big dog and I'm striping my yard. I love it. I got into it, I think, uh, during COVID because as a pastor, I needed something to work on that didn't have feelings or emotions. And I was like, the grass is my safe haven. (laughs) But anybody that's ever done yard work knows that the worst thing about doing yard work is weeds. And when we have like a birthday party or we have people coming over to our house, um, we, we have this one tree and underneath all the tree is, is these weeds and, and we always do the same thing. Uh, we just go get pine straw from Home Depot and we put enough pine straw over the weeds that when the party happens, everybody thinks your yard looks so good and then when the pine straw gives way, the weeds that were under the pine straw just grow up through the pine straw. <laughs> it works. But the only way to actually get rid of the weeds is to get down on your knees and to pull out the root. If you just mow over the weeds, they're gonna grow back, and they actually grow back faster, which is frustrating. If you just take your weed eater and trim them all down, it'll look good for a day or two, but eventually they'll all... The only way to really get rid of it is to get down to the root and pull from the root. And I want us to see what is at the root of so many of these idols. I think there's a common thread. And I believe that the common thread underneath so many of these idols is self-exaltation. Let us make a metal image, carve a metal image for our selves, for us, that we want a God that we can control, that gives us what we want, when we want it, how we want it, anytime we want it, the way we want it, that's what we want. And so let's just make one that does that. That's idolatry of the worst kind. Because when you follow the one true God, capital G God, he ain't going to do everything the way you want him to do it. Because if he worked for you, then he can't be God. So if you have a God that never confronts you or challenges you or convicts you or makes you make a a change in course in your life, then it is very possible that you crafted your own God. And think about this. If you made the God, then you are a God yourself. And I believe through, through my study of the idols that popped up throughout Israel's history and even in my own life, that the common thread, the seedbed where idols grow out of is self-exaltation. This was at the root in the garden, the first sin. It wasn't about a fruit. Now, Adam and Eve saw the fruit as being desirable. So that's the problem. When you see something as being more desirable than God, Sin's going to enter into the story. But what was the lie? The lie was, if you eat it, you will be like him. Your self will be exalted up to the level of God. And underneath every idol, self-exaltation is percolating. Let's say money is the surface idol. You can identify it. I have this idol of money in my life. It's an exterior idol. Well, money may be the idol everybody can see, but money is just a vehicle that you believe can take you to higher ground, to an elevated status, to some increased position. So money might be the idol, but you became the God. If I can use this to elevate me, the seedbed is self-exaltation, and the idol is simply the vehicle for you to go up. And that's dangerous. That's idolatry. And it breaks God's heart. And it causes you to live a small life. For many of us, if I can be honest, it's not that you need to take something off the throne. As much as it is you need to get off the throne. So when you you see what... Whatever these surface idols are, money or material things or perfectionism or relationship, and when you see all that, 
This is what we have to be able to do when it comes to idols because they're tricky, because they're good things, but good things made to be ultimate things are dangerous things. You got to scrape a few layers away. It's never what it is at face value. And when you scrape down far enough, the problem gets worse, not better. And I believe that under most of our idols is the fact that we trust in ourselves more than we trust in God. And so it might not be that you need to take materialism off the throne. It might just be that you need to get off it. And I think this self-exaltation plays such a huge role in the idol we're going to talk about for a few minutes tonight. The, my assignment tonight is the idol of hustle. The idol of hustle. I've had so much fun working on this talk. I don't know if it's for you or if it's just for me, but I'm going to tell you what I learned. I'm already convicted and God's uh, used it, so hopefully he'll use it in you, but this is an idol that I, I, I wrestle with, I, I, I struggle with. I grew up as an athlete. I, I, I went to work out before school as like a third grader, like five in the morning. I'm up going to work out. Serious. This is real life. Think about it. my parents. We should have a conversation with them now. Then I would go to school. I would ride the bus from school back to the courts to work out again. I was like a fourth grader. I would go home, do my homework, watch film, go to bed. This was my whole life was hustle, work harder than anybody. Have this work ethic. Like you can't control all the outcomes, but you can control your work ethic. And this is, this is how I grew up. And I know a lot of you are in that zone right now. You're grinding through school. You're taking a bunch of hours through the summer to try to get ahead. You're doing school and an internship, or maybe now I even love the term that everybody has a side hustle to add to your hustle. So you're hustling on double, and I respect that. But I want you to remember that idols are not evil things. They're good things that when we turn them into ultimate things, they become dangerous. So here's what I want you to hear me say. Hustle is not bad. Hard work is not bad. Work ethic is not bad. It's from God and it's a good thing. Genesis chapter two, verse 15 says, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. That's Genesis chapter two. When did the fall happen? Genesis chapter three. So before the fall, God said we should work. Work is a good thing. Work is a godly thing. Colossians 3, verse 23, it's core <laughs> to our message at Passion. Whatever you do, work at it with all of your heart, not lazily, not half-heartedly. That's the last thing we need is a bunch of lazy Christians out in the workplace. Whatever you do, work at it with all of your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord you are serving. Paul takes it up a notch in 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 10. He says, the one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. Go, Paul, my dad. That sounds like my dad. <laughs> so work is good. Work is biblical. Ambition is not inherently bad. But it begs you and me to ask the question, is my ambition self-ambition Selfish ambition or godly ambition. This is how razor thin the line is between an idol and between living out a life God wants us to live. Is my ambition in life selfish ambition or is it godly ambition? Meaning, what's the reason for your hard work? Are you finding your worth in your hustle or in your performance or in your resume or in your accolades or in your achievements? Watch out if you are. My whole life collapsed because that's how I lived most of my life. As a tennis player, I, I, I gave all of my life to this. For, for 18 years, dropped out of high school, moved to try to play at the highest level. I sacrificed more than anybody else I knew. I wasn't the most talented, but I prided myself, I will work harder than anybody else here. And when all of my worth was in the rise and fall of my success, and then when an injury came and it wasn't any more successful or not successful, it was you can't play anymore, I now had no worth. Be careful of building your worth on something as fragile as your performance. If your worth comes from your achievements, then your failures will cripple you, and you will fail. Idols often cause us to doubt the character of God. 
So performance becomes our, I love the word Camilo used, our ultimate trust. And God simply becomes our backup plan. So my ultimate trust is in my grades, is in my work ethic, is in my hustle, is in me creating my future. And if that doesn't work out, I'll figure out all this stuff back here. Somehow God will come through. It doesn't work like that with God. That doesn't honor God. That's idolatry. Yeah. Is to say, let me have my way, and if my way doesn't work, I'll come over here to your way. And that's dangerous. That's where your hustle becomes not healthy, but idolatrous. If God is our primary plan, and our hard work is even our backup plan, you need to be careful. God says, with me, I'm the only plan. I'm the only option. I am the Lord, your God, and I will not share my glory with another. For some, your resume is your God. For some, God is simply your life insurance policy should something happen to your plan tomorrow that you can't control. And God is not interested in selling life insurance. God is interested in a relationship with you. So, so I, I remember when I bought life insurance, which is a weird thing. Uh, I don't have anything to give anybody, so it's weird that I bought it. But I have a wife and I have some kids, and I thought grown-up people have life insurance. I should get some life insurance. I have no idea who the guy's name I bought it from anymore. I bought it so long ago. I don't even know what the company was. I don't know where to find it. I just told my wife, if something ever happens to me, just search my email for life insurance. And somewhere back there from many years ago, you will find something. And some of us are just like that. Somewhere back there in like eighth grade, I went to a camp and I had this moment with God and that's somewhere in the file back there if something ever goes wrong with my plan and what I'm creating for myself. And God, God it's not just that God doesn't work like that. It's you're stealing from yourself the blessing of God in your life. Because God's not gonna bless you if you're the driver of your story. He doesn't want to be in a filing cabinet. He wants to be in your every day. How silly it would be for us to trust him with our eternity and not with our tomorrow. That's idolatry. When we credit the blessing of God in our, when the, when the credit for the blessing of God in our lives goes to us instead of God, you've settled for a counterfeit God. Listen to what in Deuteronomy chapter 8, this is what it says. He, God, the Lord, led you through the vast and dreadful wilderness. He, skipping around here, brought you, out, brought you water out of a hard rock. He gave you manna to eat in the wilderness. And you may say to yourself, verse 17 of Deuteronomy chapter 8, written by Moses, you may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors as it is today. Then watch him link this back to idolatry. If you ever forget the Lord your God and follow other little G gods and worship and bow down to them, I testify against you today that you will surely be destroyed. So this, this is how it works in the hustle of our life. If, 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 if your hustle creates a future that you credit yourself for and not God for, your hustles become an idol for you. Yeah. Now, if your work ethic, which is good and godly and biblical, and if your hustle, which is good and godly and biblical, produces a future that even when you get in that future, you think, God, thank you so much for doing this for me. Yeah. That's godly ambition. That's godly ambition. Where there, if there is entitlement where there should be gratitude, watch out. If you begin to think, I deserve this, I earn this, watch out. Because you cannot strive or earn your way into the kingdom of God. You can only enter through surrender. Another question to ask yourself is this. When the trail of your life leads to you instead of to God, you have settled for a small g God. Here's what I mean by that. If all the hustle, all the work of your life creates a path 
that other people look at and they begin to follow that path, if at the end of that path they end up at you, then your hustle has become an idol for you. If people follow the path of your life and they end up at God, that's godly ambition. And that's what we're meant to do. The, the, the core verse underneath passion, Isaiah 26, 8, says, Yes, Lord, walking in the way of your truth, we wait eagerly for you, for your name and renown are the desire of our hearts. Great verse to quote, very difficult to live. The desire of my soul is your fame and your name, not my own. When underneath every idol is this temptation for self exaltation, saying that verse is a big commitment. That my life is not going to point people to me, but to you. That if people follow the trail of my life, they're not going to go, wow, look at him. They're going to go, wow, look at God. That's how you know if your ambition is selfish ambition or godly ambition. So let's tease this out. Let's say you work hard to get the internship that you wanted. And the question is, why? And your answer is, so that I can get the job that I want. And the question is, why? And your answer is, so that you can get the salary that you dreamed of. And the question is, why? See how idolatry works? You got to scrape a couple layers to get down to the root. Uh, So that you can get the house in the right neighborhood for your family. Why? Because if I get the house in the right neighborhood for my family, I will achieve the status that I always wanted in life, and people will look to me. Bingo. Scraped it all the way. At the very bottom was self-exaltation. Wrapped up in my work ethic and my hustle. Now, you could ask the same questions. So you work hard to get the internship. Why? So that I can get into the master's program that I wanted to get into. Why? So that I can get the job at this company that I always wanted to work for. Why? So that I can use the gifts God gave me to be a light in my company and make the salary that I always wanted to make. Oh, I see salary. Why, why do you want to do that? So that I can leverage the resources that God entrusts to me for kingdom causes. Great. Same work ethic. Same hustle. Different outcomes. One of them is self-exaltation, and one of them is God-exaltation. So I want you to hear me say this. God is not a fan of lazy people. There's a warning against that in the scripture. The message tonight is beware of hustling. We we should just be over here, you know, at our coffee shop, working a little bit, reading our Bible all day. No, God says, I'm sending you out into the world to be on mission. So we need you to go and we need you to work hard, but we need your worth not to be tied up in your work. We need you to go into the workplace and work hard and communicate to people, the reason I'm able to do this is because I already have my value. So I'm not here to get my value. I already got my value. I'm just here now from my value to add value to the kingdom that Jesus is building because I don't really need to build one for myself because I'm already in his kingdom. That's the difference. For the one, hustle is part of building the kingdom. And for the other, Hustle is part of building their kingdom. One is obedience and the other is rebellion. The question is less about should we hustle and more about why are you hustling? If your hustle is a vehicle to make your name great, then it's become an idol. You see this in Genesis chapter 11. I just want to look at a few texts to give you a a biblical picture of this. Genesis chapter 11 the story of the <coughs> Tower of Babel, same place Miles was talking about. Babylon, Babylon is Babel. Babel became Babylon, so, so we're in the same place here, uh, but, but we're uh, significantly before in the story from where Miles was last time. Genesis chapter 11, I want to I read you these verses, the first uh, seven. No, the first nine. <coughs> it says, now the, world, now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, side note, never a good sign in the beginning story of God. Anything moving east is moving away from God. They found a plain in Shinar and settled there. And they said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we can make a great name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city. Don't you love that? 
Here they are saying, let's build a tower all the way up to the heavens. But you can't build a tower big enough that God doesn't have to come down to see. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. And the Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language, they have begun to do this, then nothing they do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so that they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there all over the earth, and they stopped building the city. That's why it's called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world from where the Lord scattered them all over the surface of the whole earth. Now, this story is rooted in disobedience, a lack of trust in God, which is a guaranteed breeding ground for an idol or a counterfeit God. God has told them, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. Five times before Genesis 11, God says to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. Scatter, he tells them five times. Scatter, 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 scatter. And and look what they say. Come, let us build a city for ourselves with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, what? Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. Disobedience is a seedbed of idolatry. And you see it in this story. You see them say in this text, let us build a great tower that reaches up to the heavens, which is interesting. So there's an acknowledgement that the heavens exist. Let us Make this great tower that reaches all the way up to the heavens. Meaning, we're going to acknowledge there are heavens. There's a God in heaven. We just want to be associated with him on our own terms. So we'll build a tower that'll get us there. That's dangerous. It's dangerous to come to God on your own terms. You you can only come to God on Jesus' terms. He's the door that you must enter through. But look at what was underneath it all. We're going to resist God. We're moving eastward. We're going to rebel against God. It actually says before this that while God told them to scatter, it says that their desire was not to scatter, but to settle. Comfort was an idol in their lives. And then it says, let us build this great tower and make a name for ourselves. This is the story of humanity, that we have a propensity to want to creep onto the throne ourselves and make our names great and make our names the one that everybody remembers. And yet the text in Isaiah says, your name, and your renown are the desire of our souls. So all of their work in building this great tower, tremendous work, tremendous tremendous coordination with a lot of different people to build this tower was a lot of hustle, a lot of work, a lot of hard work. But it was selfish ambition. Why? Because if you follow the trail of their life, their desire was our names will be great. That's idolatry. The trail of your life leads people to you and not to God. There's idolatry in your story. And yet, it's beautiful that God comes down to see the tower they're building. And he sees their rebellion and their disobedience. And what does it say at the end? I love this. Verse 8. So the Lord scattered them from there all over the earth. The Lord's plans will prevail. He told them to scatter. They said, no, we're going to settle. They scattered. Because what God wants, God does. So when you resist or rebel or bow to something lesser than him, You just rob yourself of the story of being in the story of God and the blessing of moving with him. Either way, he's going to accomplish his purposes. 
Let us make a great name for ourselves. You see in Paul, in Philippians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul, the most boss Christian of the New Testament, turn there real quick and we'll, we'll close with this in just a minute. It says this in verse 3 of chapter 3, Philippians. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, <coughs> and who put no confidence in the flesh. I love that. Though I myself have reasons for such confidence. Subtle flex from Paul. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. A little bit less subtle flex from Paul. <laughs> Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. What's he doing? He's listing out his resume, and it's impressive. He says, if anybody's got reason to be prideful, if anybody's got reason to lift their name up, it would be me, Paul says, from the right family, from the right town, got the right background, went to the right school, got the right job. I did all the things right. Look at me, he says. But look what he says in verse 7. But whatever were gains to me, what translation, whatever benefit in future my hustle could create for me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider all that, everything a loss because of the surpassing, I love this, thank you Lord, because of the surpassing what? Worth. What is worship? It comes from what word? Worthship. So he goes, I'm not going to give my worship to all this stuff over here that's worthless, it's just garbage, but because I now my eyes have been opened to something that is surpassingly great, something that is worth worshiping. Because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, what? Meaning, not one that I could work for, not one that comes from the law and my performance and my accolades and my hustle and my do-gooding, but that which is through faith in Christ, which is only by grace. You receive it, you don't earn it. The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and the participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection of the dead. In Paul, you see this beautiful picture of the difference between selfish ambition and godly ambition. There's not one person in this room who could look me in the eye and tell me that Paul became lazy when he met Jesus. I would venture to say the dude worked a lot harder after meeting Jesus than he did before he met Jesus. And before he met Jesus, the dude worked pretty hard. He just listed his resume and it was impressive. So, so it's not the followers of Jesus, we're gonna, we're gonna do nothing. It's we're gonna work very hard. We're, we're gonna be excellent. This guy wrote most of the New Testament. But if you follow the trail of our life, it's not gonna lead you to me. It's gonna lead you to God. It's gonna lead you to Jesus. Why? Because of his surpassing worth. Paul knew, you come to me, I'm not worth worshiping, I'm gonna let you down. Why? Because anything you love more than you love God, you will crush that object under the weight of your expectations. So don't expect anything from me that you can only get from God. If you do that, you're making me an idol. I don't wanna be an idol. I wanna be a worshiper. And for somebody in this room, my prayer for you at the intersection of life that you're into, you are right now at the crosshairs of deciding what your life will be about. Where are you going to study? What master's degree are you going to get? What school are you going to go to? What internship are you going to take? What job are you going to take? Which person are you going to you marry? Isn't that overwhelming when you're in your season of life? God I was so anxious when I graduated from undergrad. And I had a couple extra years of undergrad to think about it. 
I couldn't figure it out. I, I didn't know how all the steps were going to work. I couldn't see how my work could create the future that I wanted. And God was doing something in me. God was saying to me, if you want the future that you can create, you're going to settle for less. But if you'll trust me and put your hands to the plow, work hard as you're working for the Lord, but don't work hard so that you can be approved of by everybody else. Work hard because you've already been approved of by me. I will create a future for you that will blow your mind. And I'm here as living proof that he'll do that. The question is, who do you trust more? You or him? And for many of you tonight, it would be so easy, honestly, if you just said, I know what the idol is for me. It's an idol of performance. I just, I, I want to be great at everything. I want to work hard. I want to work harder than everybody else. I just have this idol of performance. You know, for me, it's this idol of relationship. It's this idol of whatever, whatever. And I, I just am begging you to not use a weed eater, <laughs> but to get down at the root and go, maybe... Maybe there is some surface level idols in your life. For sure there is. But if you scrape those away enough, maybe underneath it all, you will see it's not really that the money needs to come off the throne. It's just that I need to get off of it. And I need to align this throne of my heart and my life so that it matches the throne of heaven. And I want to let Jesus, the one who has surpassing worth, be seated on the throne of my life. And I want to I pray for you if you do that. I think it's the greatest decision you can make. You know, what Paul says in Colossians is it's not about uh, what you do or where you go. It's about whatever you do. So be less worried and anxious about, am I going to go to this school or that school? Am I going to study this or that? Am I going to do this job or that job? Be less worried about that. And be more, you know, be, be more concerned about wherever you go, why are you going there? Whatever you do, why are you doing it? Are you doing it so that people will elevate you and say, look at you? Are you creating a trail of faithfulness and excellence in your life that people will watch and follow the trail until they see the cross of Jesus Christ? And in that, you will, you will not settle for a temporary reward, but you'll get an eternal one, which is worth way more and lasts way longer. So I want to pray and just trying to think about how do we respond to this message. And I feel like the Lord just is a physical representation tonight. And I know this isn't everybody in the room, um, but it is for somebody in the room today. Because when you think about your life, there's a lot of self-exaltation going on. And when you take inventory, you're on the throne of your own life. And before we trim all the weeds, let's just get down to the root. And before we get those things off, Let's just get off it ourselves, and some of those will come off it when we get off of it. And I just think it's a physical representation to seal a moment up. It'd be awesome if just from your chair, you get up, you get off, and you kneel. Just as a way of saying, I don't belong on the throne, God. I've been on it for too long. It doesn't work for me. I'm going to get up. I'm going to step off. And I'm going to take my rightful position as it relates to the throne, which is just simply this. And if that's you today, I want to just encourage you, not for a hypey moment, but just to seal up at the end of the summer what God's doing of saying, less of you, more of him. I'm up. I'm off the throne. Jesus have your rightful place. And I'd just like to encourage you to do that. I'm going to give you a moment for you to pray. I'm not going to pray as the pastor for you. I'm just going to give you a moment because you know what the representation means. For you to get off the throne, you know what that's going to cost you. And I just want to give you a moment to just have that conversation with God. To repent, to turn away, to say, God, I'm sorry. And to say, I want you to be seated on the throne of my life. And I want to stop giving my worship to worthless things. And I don't want self-exaltation to be the seedbed of my life. I want the gospel to be the seedbed of my life. So I'm just going to give you, it's going to be a minute. 
be quiet just for you and God to have a conversation. Then I'll pray and we'll worship together. God, we thank you tonight for your, for your kindness and for your patience with us. Just speak for me now, but there's something so deeply wired into my humanity that just is tempted and, and lured to think so much of life is about me or to settle for so much less than your story to give my worship to worthless things and my time and my affection and my resources. And I wanna say on behalf of all of us that we're sorry. That we're sorry for sitting when we should have kneeled. And we just wanna say to you tonight, take your rightful place. We're not telling you that you're worthy or deserving of the throne. We're just realizing today that we're not. Pray for a young man and a young woman in this space today, God. That you've gifted with a mind somewhere in business school right now and the opportunities in front of them are endless. Would you save them from settling for the smallest one? Do you save them from the temptation to make all of life about themselves and building earthly kingdoms? And would you somehow seal up in a moment tonight that all of our life, our vapor of a life, you've given us the opportunity to live on mission, a mission that lasts forever? so they could go and they could work hard and they could be in business and they could make lots of money and they could have lots of resources, but that the trail of their life wouldn't prop themselves up, but would lead people to you. Pray for people that you've gifted to be school teachers and doctors and lawyers and so many different areas of culture. I pray tonight that you would seal up. I gave you the gift, not so that you could use the gift to make much of you, not so that your hustle could create a nice, comfortable future where you get everything you want your way when you want it, but some, somehow you would, you would center and concrete our hearts around this idea tonight that you've given us everything to be used for you, that everything is from you and through you and for you. And might somebody live their whole lives differently? Not because of a talk or because of a night at church, but because they surrendered their life 
and said to you, take your rightful place. I don't want to negotiate. I don't want to be an acquaintance with you. I want you to be Lord of my life. What you say goes, and I want to go wherever, whenever, however, so that I can be on mission for the greatest story ever told. Let us live big lives, Jesus. Big lives that impact lots of people, but that lead every single person through us all the way to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. What a night, what a summer. Uh, I, I love the obedience with which Pastor Grant submitted to the Spirit as he was ministering, not even the message, as incredible as it was, but at that beginning moment, most of you uh, had your eyes closed and head bowed, but but everything that we just talked about tonight, putting, getting yourself off the throne and putting Jesus on the throne, ultimately, 15 people put their faith in Jesus at the beginning of this night. Oh, you didn't hear me. I said 15 people put their faith, their ultimate, their functional trust in the person of Jesus Christ. which wasn't even as much a decision as it was a revelation, as it was a gift from God to them, that he removed the scales from their eyes and let them see, and it was a beautiful moment. I just wanna know before we move, before we continue, we're wrapping up, we just have a few important dates we wanna tell you about, but, but is that anyone else in this room before we go, anyone else who uh, wanted to make that decision, to put your faith, your, your trust, your hope in Jesus, to, to repent? to turn from your own way, to turn from you being Lord, to turn from you being on the throne of your life, and to make Jesus, to put Jesus in his rightful place, to put him on the throne. I just wonder before we go, uh, if that was anyone else in, in here, that as Pastor Grant was ministering, that you were convicted, that, that you were uh, pricked in the heart, that you need to make Jesus Lord of your life. Is that anyone here? with a raised hand that I can see. Just, I see this hand right here. Praise God for you. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Is there, is there anyone else just so I know? I'm gonna, we're going to pray all together in a minute, and I love that her girls are already hugging her. It's beautiful. Is there anyone else in this place? Mm-hmm. All while Pastor Grant was talking at the beginning, he kept saying, it may just be one. I feel like it's just one. There were 15 people. The, the just one was you in this moment. The Lord waited on you in this moment. We thank God for you. We thank God for what he's doing in this place. In fact, we'll, let's just all... Uh, pray together. I know this is the last summer in the city. Some of you are about to head back to another city, another state to go to school. Some are doing school right here in the city, continuing with us, young professionals, all of us who are working and just entering this new season. It's August the 1st. I just want to pray, seal this up in the name of Jesus, but also just pray, commission all of us as we go out. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for tonight. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you're doing in this place. Thank you for what you have let us be witnesses to, from baptisms to, to worship to, to the word open to the spirit moving as 16 people, 16 of your sons, 16 of your daughters decided to move into life, decided that soon at the next summer in the city, they may be the ones getting baptized. Lord, you do the miraculous. You are more than able. You are great. You are who we want to sing to. You are worthy. I'm praying over everyone heading back to a campus that you would fill them with with your spirit in such a way that their campus would never be the same. Right here in Atlanta, Georgia State will not look how it looks today. Georgia Tech will not look how it looks today. Kennesaw, Emory, Scad, Oglethorpe, Agnes Scott, Life University, Morehouse, Spelman, Clark Atlanta, Morris Brown. These schools will not look how they look today because there is a generation heading back out that has you in your rightful place. Our businesses will not look the same. Our, our offices will not look the same. Our hustles will not look the same. We are putting you in your throne we're putting you in your rightful place and saying great are you lord you are the one we want to sing to you are the one who's worthy and for these people who you've raised from the dead the resurrection miracle we've seen tonight i pray that you bind them to you in a new way i pray that over the next few weeks they have such a connection with you that is like nothing they've ever experienced before in their life do what only you can do lord we love you lord we trust you lord we worship you now amen 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 Come on, let's just sing this out. Tell them, tell them, tell them. Tell them, tell them, tell them.
this is what puts a smile on the face of our Father. This is what puts a smile on the face of our King. This is beautiful. This room is, is, is beautiful. I'm so grateful for all that God has done tonight. If you're grateful, could we just make some noise to Jesus real quick? All he's done in our midst. Hallelujah. Great are you, Lord. Hey, I want to give you three dates. Pull out your phones because I don't want you to miss these three dates, and then I'm going to let you go three dates. Today is August 1st. Three things I need you to know about. The first is Above and Beyond Sunday is coming. We got a shout. I love it. August 13th. Now, this is our uh, Generosity Sunday. It's a Sunday where we come together as a house and see where we give above and beyond so to see and have room in our storehouse for God when he's ready to move us, for us to go above and beyond in all he wants to do. This room is only possible because there were some people who decided to give. There were some people who decided to make a way, right? And so we want to be a part of that. It's going down on August 13th at all three of our locations. I want you to be there. I do not want to be a part of leading a ministry where the young adults say, oh, yeah, the, the, the ones with the, the life insurance, they'll handle that. No, we are going to be a part of this moment too, whatever that looks like for you. If you can give $10 extra, if you can give $20 extra, some of you have never given to this church at all, and it has blessed you time and time again. That's not a call out. That's a, a rise up and say, hey, no, I want to be a part. If that's the God I'm singing about, that's how he's moving in this place. I want to be a part of the story there. So August 13th, make sure that you join us either here at 515 down south at Trillith. Any Trillith people make it tonight? I know my Trillith people come strong or at Cumberland. Cumberland people, y'all here? So strong, so strong. August 13th, number two, the five o'clock is coming back August 20th. My friend Jonathan Pakluda is gonna be here in the mix. Our friends from Elevation Worship are gonna be here in the mix. You are not gonna wanna miss it. It's going down right here at 515. And then YA is gonna have a little after party just for all the young adults right in the back. So make sure you're here. It's a great time to bring somebody, all right? I like the swag, I like how we rocking. This is a nice vibe, it's beautiful. Okay, last thing is so big, so huge, I can't make the announcement myself, is Campbell Sims. Campbell, come here real quick. Y'all make some noise for Campbell. Finally made it, my boy. It's good to see you. Hey, what's going down August 22nd, and kind of what's going down tonight? August 22nd, but first, what's going down tonight? We don't just operate during the summer. We actually keep this party going all year round. And tonight, applications for family groups open. Can I get an amen? They are for open right, right now. now. Literally right now. So right now, on your way, not on your way home. Before you leave to go home, when you get home. Look up in your search bar, PCC Young Adults. Click on the link. The first thing that pops up should be Family Group Supply. They're going to be great. We're super it's amazing. For them. The link's in our bio. We believe that growth happens in groups, people. This is amazing, but what the enemy will do is snuff this out. If you do not have some community and some discipleship in your life, get in a family group. I'm excited. And then August 22nd is August what? August 22nd. We're having Collective Night. Our first Collective we Night of the back. year is August 22nd. So that's when our groups will launch. So go home, sign up for a group, and then we'll see you right here August 22nd for our first collective night of the year. It's going to be beautiful. Hey, real quick, if someone doesn't see a group in their right. area or their school isn't listed, right. what can they do? They should send us an email. Send us an email. Young adults, Young adults at, at passioncitychurch.com. Beautiful. And send then an if someone, we're still looking yeah. for a couple leaders. If right. there were some people who maybe snuck in, you're not quite 18 and 25, <laughs> you're a little older, but you want to disciple some folks, right. what should they do? They should also email us at Young adults at passioncitychurch.com. We'd love to talk to you, talk through that process, and figure it out. Be amazing. We would love to have you join us, join our family. Uh, can we thank Pastor Grant one more time for that message that he brought for us tonight? Thank you, sir. Incredible. We honor you. Hey, head on out. Stop by the First Time Lounge if you haven't. If you need to go to Access, that's a space where if you need prayer, we'd love to pray with you. And then we got new merch out there, hoodies, all this stuff. You want to give that one away? Yeah, I'm going to go. I'm going to go to the Elevated, though. Okay. Like they need elevated, some love. the hoodie's coming to you. Yeah, he's giving it personally. He's not going to throw it. That's less of a moment. Hey, we love you. Have a great time. We'll see you here soon.